However, there's really no way of knowing how many serial killers have gone unidentified. When you take into account historical record-keeping systems that weren't always accurate, who knows how many serial killers have been overlooked? Add in countries that don't share their statistics outside their borders, let alone within, it's possible the numbers are higher than believed. The intention of this book is not to glorify or glamorize serial killers, nor to sensationalize their crimes or further victimize their victims. But the fact remains, people are interested in and fascinated by this subject matter. We want to know what happened and, if possible, why it happened. Crime, particularly serial murder, is at the extreme end of the human experience. Our interest in true crime isn't a new phenomenon. We've been interested in the subject for centuries. One of the best-known examples are the popular crime broadsides, or crime sheets, of 18th and 19th century England, which were often sold to spectators at public executions. In the old days, people crowded into courtrooms to observe criminal trials firsthand. Newspapers even published extra editions though it's unlikely much in the way of analysis was provided. It was more about sensationalism and cheap entertainment for the masses. So how does today's true crime writing differ from yesterday's? Although you can still find examples that have more in common with the past than the present, the readership has changed, thereby raising the bar for contemporary true crime writers. As readers, we expect more than salacious reports. We expect our content to have substance. Like traditional journalism, true crime is reporting on what happened and who it happened to, but it's also providing context and analysis. It's even giving a voice to those who weren't heard or may no longer be able to speak. The reader comes away from the experience with more than just a lurid headline and a few juicy bites of information. The best new true crime stories, Serial Killers, contains accounts from an international group of contributors, from award-winning crime writers and true crime podcasters to journalists and experts in the field. They have researched extensively on their subjects. Some have encountered their subjects personally or peripherally, drawing upon memories and experiences to tell a story only they can tell. So, if you're looking for fascinating and thought-provoking content from some of today's best writers of true crime, you've come to the right place. Mitzi Soretto The Quiet Man in the Overalls Struggled to be Heard by Stephen Wade. There is an image of Dennis Nilsson that dominates the media and imprints him on the minds of readers, researchers, and criminologists across the globe. He wears blue overalls, and he looks placid, still, and silent. In fact, as is the case with so many biographical profiles of dangerous killers, the image could be of the guy next door who spends time with a wrench or a drill and works on his auto, or makes things in wood. Most of us perhaps put these criminals in a special compartment in our minds, a spot with a label reading, mad and bad. In other words, we leave out the ongoing debates in criminology about an offense coming from a person who is mad or bad. No, we think, they have lost their court battle to avoid responsibility, and they are destined to be a killer, locked away. One true crime reader at a talk I gave once put it this way, Look, these guys who scoot around slitting throats, hurl them into a dark hole and piss on them. Now I've worked in jails, so I won't take that angle, but neither would I be soft in the head by making sure their dirty laundry is washed for them, and that they have choices of muesli every breakfast alongside fresh eggs and bacon. But I do think about the issue of retribution as opposed to rehabilitation and I've never yet found an answer to the question about jail. Does prison work?